The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's start. So we've been looking at the XY model in two dimensions. It is a collection of uh, unit spins located on a site of uh, potentially a lattice in two dimensions. Since they are unit vectors, each one of them is characterized by an angle theta i. And uh, the partition function would be obtained by integrating over all of the angles of a weight that we said had the form k cosine of theta i minus theta j. So there is a coupling that corresponds to the dot product of neighboring spins, which can be written as this cosine form. If we go to low temperatures, where uh, k is large, then this was roughly an integral over all configurations of a continuous field, theta of x, with a weight that is, with appropriate choice of the lattice spacing, the same k integral of gradient of theta squared. Now, if we look at this weight and ask what is happening as a function of changing temperature or the inverse of this parameter, so that we are close to zero temperature, well, if we just work with this Gaussian, the conclusion would be that if we look at the correlation between two spins that are located at a distance r from each other, just from this Gaussian weight, we found that these correlations decay as something like 1 over r, or maybe we put some kind of a lattice spacing, to a power of an exponent eta that was related to this k. So the conclusion was, was that if that is the appropriate weight, we have power law decay of correlations. There is, there is no long range order, but correlations decay very weakly. On the other hand, if we start with the full cosine and don't do this low temperature expansion, just go and do a typical high temperature expansion, from the high temperature expansion, we conclude that these correlations decay exponentially, which are two totally different forms. And presumably, there should be some kind of a critical value of k, or temperature, that separates a low temperature form with power law decay and a high temperature form with exponential decay of correlations. Now, there was no sign of such a KC when we tried to do a low temperature expansion like the nonlinear sigma model in this particular case of the XY model that corresponds to n equals to 2. Again, we said that the reason for that is that the only higher order terms that I can write down in this theory, close to low temperature, gradient of theta to the fourth, sixth, etc., are explicitly irrelevant. And unlike n equals to 3, etc., they cannot cause any change. So as far as the, that theory was con uh, concerned, all of these corresponded to being fixed points. Then, we said that uh, there is a twist that is not taken into account 
when I make that transformation in the first line, as pointed out by Pasterlitz and Thales, what you have are topological defects that are left out. And an example of such a defect would be a configuration of spins that are kind of radiating out from some particular point, such that when I complete a circuit going around, the value of spin changes by 2 pi, or the gradient at the distance r, gradient of the change in angle should fall off as 1 over r. So if we put one of these defects and calculate what the partition function is for one defect, z of one defect, we would say, OK, what I have to do is to calculate the energy cost of this distortion. If I use that theory that I have over there, I have k over 2. I have an integral over uh, all space, which because of the symmetry here, I can write as 2 pi r dr. And then I have the gradient squared. And as I said, the gradient for a topological defect like, such as this goes as 1 over r. Its square goes like 1 over r squared. So this is an integral that is logarithmically divergent. It's an integral of 1 over r. It is logarithmically divergent both at large distances, let's say, of the order of the size of the system and has difficulty at short distances. But at short distances, we know that there is some lattice structure. And this approximation will break down when I get to some order of some multiple lattice spacings, let's call that A. And that the additional energy that comes from all of the interactions that are smaller than this core value of A, I have to separately calculate. And I'm going to call them. Uh, beta epsilon uh, that depends on the distance a that I choose for the core. This is just the energy term that goes into the Boltzmann factor. But this defect can be placed any place in a lattice that has size l up to this factor of 1 over a that I call the size of the core. So the number of places goes like L over A squared, the area that I'm looking at. And so we see that this expression actually goes like L over A. I have the power 2 here. And from this logarithmic interaction, I will get here a power of 2 pi k log L over A, which I can absorb into this. And I define the exponential of the core energy to be some parameter y that clearly depends on the choice of what I call my uh, core. Okay. So if I look at just that expression by itself, I would say that there is the chance to see one defect or no defects as L over A becomes large in the thermodynamic limit, depending on whether this exponent is positive or negative. So we are kind of, uh, oops, I forgot the factor of 2 here. It's 1 over pi k. We are led from this expression that something interesting should happen at some kc for one defect, which is uh, let's call it the inverse of the Kc, that is like the temperature, which is pi over 2. So maybe around pi over 2 here, there should be something interesting that happens. In fact, if the theory was 
independent vortices, I would predict that there would be no vortices up to here, and then there would be whole bunches of vortices that would be appearing later on. But the point is that there are, these are not vortices that don't interact with each other. There are interactions between them. And if I look at a situation with many vortices, what I need to do is to calculate a partition function for the defects, for the vortices, that I, has resemblance to the Coulomb system. So we call it Z sub Q. And this Z sub Q is obtained by summing over all numbers of these defects that can appear in the system. So let's do a sum over n, starting from 0 to however many. And if I have a situation in which there are n vortices in the system, I clearly have to pay a cost of y per core of each one of them. So there is a factor of y raised to the power of n. These vortices then can be placed anywhere on the lattice in the same way that I had this factor of L over A for a single vortex. I will have ability to put each one of these vortices at some point on the lattice. And then we found that when you do the calculation, the distortions that are caused by the independent vortices clearly add up on top of each other. And when we added up and superposed the gradient of thetas that correspond to the different vortices and calculated the integral of gradient of theta squared, what we found was that there was an interaction between them that I could write as uh, uh, 4 pi squared k sum over distinct pairs, i less than j, qi, qj, the Coulomb interaction between sides xi and xj. And actually, the form of this came about as follows that basically the charges of these topological defects are multiples of 2 pi. But these qi's that I have written are minus plus 1. So the 2 pi's are absorbed in the, uh, the charges, the actual charges being 2 pi is what makes this 4 pi squared. k okay, is the strength of the interaction. Furthermore, we have to require the system to be overall neutral, because otherwise there would be a large energy for creating the monopole in a large system. And uh, again, just as a matter of notation, our C of x has a 1 over 2 pi itself, log of the displacement in units of this A because we can't allow these things to come very close to each other. Okay. So our task was to calculate properties encoded in this partition function, <coughs> which is, in some sense, a grand canonical system of charges that can appear and disappear. And our expectation is that at uh, low temperatures, essentially, all I have are a few dipoles that are kind of small. As I go to higher temperature, the two monopoles making the dipole can fluctuate and go further from each other. And eventually, at some point, they will be all mixed up together, and the picture should be regarded as a mixture of plus and minus charges in a plasma. Yes? Question, uh, if we have an external field, would this also defects of the existence of uh, the BNC? Like an edge or something external? Uh, 
It is very hard to imagine what that external field has to be in the language of the XY model. Because what you can do is you can put a field that, let's say, rotates the spins on one side, let's say, to point down, spins on the other side to point up. But then what happens is that the angles would adjust themselves so that at zero temperature, you would have a configuration that would go from plus to minus. And all the topological charges would be on top of that base configuration. So that kind of field certainly does not have any effect that I can ascribe over here. If I change my picture completely and say, forget about the XY model, think about this as a system of point charges, then I can certainly, like I did last time, put an electric field on the system and see what happens. Yes? Uh, are we saying that we can create even bigger defects where Q would be not plus minus one, or yes. plus minus bigger integer? Right. But that's uh, discounted as high order effect. Right? Yes. So in principle, you could go beyond that. You <coughs> could have a fugacity or for creation of uh, cores of single charge, another one for cores of double charge, etc. you expect those Ys for double charges to be much larger because the configuration is going to be more difficult at the core. Okay? And in some sense, you can imagine that we are including something similar to that because we can create two single charges that are close enough to each other. Um, so yes. why is the ground state uh, Dipoles instead of like quadrupoles? Is that high order? Uh, well, you would expect that if y is a small parameter, you would like to create as few things as possible. Oh. The reason you create any is because you have entropy gain, right? So I would say energetically, even creating a pair is unfavorable. Yes. But the pair has lots of places that it can go. So because of the gain in entropy, it is willing to accept that. If I create a quadrupole, you say, well, I break the quadrupole into two dipoles, and then I have much more entropy. So that's why it's not. Uh, you can have that there, but it is going to have much less weight. OK? All right. So I won't repeat the calculation, but last time we indeed asked what happens if we have, uh, let's say, some kind of an electric field. And because of the presence of the electric fields, dipoles are going to be uh, realigned. And the effect of that is to reduce the effective strength of all kinds of Coulomb interactions. We found that the effective strength was reduced by from K by an amount that was related to the likelihood of creating the dipole of size R. And that was clearly proportional to Y squared e to the minus uh, uh, from there 4 pi squared K. Uh, log of R over A. That's the probability to create a dipole of this size. And then I had to, in principle, integrate over all dipole sizes. But this writing this as an orientationally independent result is not correct because in the presence of electric field, you have more likelihood to be oriented in one direction as opposed to the other direction. So this factor of e to the cosine theta, et cetera, when we expanded, first of all, gave us an average of cosine of theta squared. So there was a factor of 1 half here. Rather than full rotation, I was doing an average of cosine squared, giving me uh, that factor. Uh, Expanding that actually gave me the factor of 4 pi squared k because of the Coulomb term that I had up there. And then uh, I had essentially the polarizability of one of these objects 
that goes like r squared. Again, coming from expanding this factor that we have in the exponent. Uh, actually, I calculated everything in units of A, so I should really do this. And this was correct to order of y squared. And in principle, one can imagine that there are configurations of four charges, quadrupole-like things, etc., that further modify this. And that this is a result that I have to, uh, oops, this was one minus. It was an overall factor of k. This was the correction term that we calculated. And uh, then the size of these dipoles, we have to integrate from a to the size of the system, or if you like, to infinity. And uh, although we were attempting to make an expansion in powers of y, what we see is that because this is giving me a factor of a over r, the r has to be integrated against these three factors of r dr. Whether or not this integral is dominated by its upper cutoff and hence divergent depends on value of k that is related to uh, the same divergence that we had for a single vortex. So this perturbation theory is in principle not valid no matter how much y I try to make small as long as uh, my k inverse is greater than pi over 2. So what we decided to do was not to do this entire integration that gives us infinity, but rather to recast this as a renormalization group in which core size is changed from A to B A. Now, one way to see the effect of it, I, last time I did this slightly differently, is uh, to ensure that the result for the partition function for one charge is unmodified. If I simply do this change, the weight should not change for one defect. And so clearly you can see that there is a change in power of B that I would have that I need to uh, compensate by changing the core energy by a factor of uh, b to the power of 2 minus pi k. Okay. So the statement that I had for z1 in order for z1 to be left invariant, I have to rescale the core energies by this factor. And then over here, I essentially just uh, integrate up to a factor of BA, just get rid of those interactions, and so this becomes minus 4 pi cubed k squared, uh, y squared, because we are looking at dipole contribution, integral from A to BA, of uh, the r r cubed divided by a to the fourth a over r to the power of uh, 2 pi k. Uh, which means that I probably made a mistake somewhere. Yeah, this has a 2 pi. I forgot the 2 pi from the definition of the lock. Okay. So these are the recursion relations. So basically, the same results at large scale for the Coulomb gas can be obtained either by the theory that is parameterized by y and the original k, or after going to this uh, 
uh, removal of short distance degrees of freedom by a theory in which y is modified by this factor and k is modified by this factor. Okay? And as usual, we can change these recursion relations into flow equations by choosing a value of b that is very close to 1, and then essentially converting these things to y evaluated at a slightly larger than 1, and from that constructing dy by dl. And dy by dl simply becomes 2 minus pi k times y. And I can do the same thing here, write this as k plus dk by dl. The k part cancels. And what I will get is that dk by dl is minus 4 pi cubed uh, y square, uh, k squared y squared. And actually, all I need to do is evaluate this on the shell, where r equals to a. And you can see that the integral essentially gives me 1. It gives me a delta l, basically goes over here. So these are order of y squared. Actually, it is kind of better to cast results rather than in terms of k, in terms of k inverse, which is kind of like a temperature variable. And then what we get is that d by dl of k inverse essentially is going to be minus 1 over k squared d by dl of k squared. So the minus k squared cancels, and it simply becomes 4 pi cubed y squared order of y to the fourth, and dy by dl is actually 2 minus pi k y plus order of y. So these are the equations that describe the change in parameters under rescaling for this Coulomb gas. And so we can plot them. Essentially, we have two parameters, y, and we have k inverse. And what we see is that k inverse, its change is always positive. So the flow should always be to the right. While whether y increases or decreases depends on whether I am above or below this critical value of 2 over pi that we keep encountering. And in particular, what we find is that there is a trajectory that goes into this point. And if you are to the left of that trajectory, y is getting smaller, k inverse is getting larger. So you go like this. Eventually, you, however, land on a point down here where y has gone to 0. And if y has gone to 0, then k inverse does not change. So you have a structure where you have a line of fixed points. So any point over here is a fixed point, but it is also a stable fixed point. It is true that points that are over here, if you are exactly at y equals to 0, are fixed points. But as soon as you have a little bit of y, then they start flowing away. And essentially, the general pattern of flows is something like this. Okay. So I go back to my original 
uh, XY model, and I'm at some value at low temperatures, means that I'm down here, but presumably there is a finite cost for creating the core. So I may be over here. And then I go to slightly higher temperature, K inverse becomes larger, but the core energy typically becomes uh, <coughs> smaller also at lower temperatures because everything is scaled, Y is scaled by 1 over KT. So as I go to higher and higher temperatures, my XY model presumably goes through some trajectory. The trajectory of changing the XY model as temperature is modified has nothing to do with RG. So basically is XY model on increasing P. And what is happening in the XY model on increasing P is that at low temperatures, I'm at some point here, which if I look at larger and larger scales, I find that eventually I go to a place where the effective core cost for creating vortices is so large that they are not created at all. So then I'm back to that theory that has no vortices and simply gradient squared, and I expect that correlations will be given by this power law type of form. However, at some point, I am in this region, and when I'm in this region, I find that maybe even initially uh, the core energy goes down, or Y goes down, but eventually I end up going to a regime where both Y is large and effective temperature, K inverse, are large. So essentially anywhere here, eventually at large scales, I will see that I will be creating vortices pretty much at ease and at sufficiently long, large scale, my picture should be that of a plasma in which the plus, plus and minus charges are moving around. And so then there is this transition line that separates the two regimes. Okay? So let's find the behavior of that. And clearly what I need to do is to focus in the vicinity of this fixed point that controls the transition. That is, anything that undergoes the transition eventually comes and flows to the vicinity of this point. So what we can do is we can construct, if you like, a two-dimensional blow-up of that. And what I'm going to do is to introduce a variable x, which is k inverse minus 2 over pi. Essentially, how far I have gone from this, in this direction, y I can use as y itself. And so what we see is that uh, my k inverse is uh, 2 over pi, my critical value. I think that should be a pi over 2. Uh, ba, 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 ba. K inverse is pi over 2. Thank you. Which means that this has to be pi over 2. This has to be pi over 2. And this I can write as pi over 2. 1 plus 2x over pi, so that to lowest order in x, k is 2 over pi, the inverse of this factor, which is 1 minus 2x over pi, plus order of x squared, so I'm expanding for small x. I put that value in here, and I find that my dy by dl is now 2 minus pi times what I have over there. So it is pi times 2 over pi. So it becomes 2 plus 4 over pi x. So essentially, I have minus 4 over pi squared. I multiply by pi. It becomes plus 4 over pi x. 
multiply by y. So this is simply a 4 over pi xy. Now the point is that typically we are used to expanding in the vicinity of an important fixed point. And all the cases that we had seen so far, once we did that expansion, we ended up with a linear behavior. The y by dl was something times y. Here we see that the vicinity of this point is clearly a quadratic type of behavior. And this quadratic behavior leads to some unusual and interesting critical behavior that we're going to explore. So let's stick with this a little bit longer. You can see that if I look at d by dl of y squared, it is going to be 2y dy by dl. So I have to multiply this by 2y. So I will get 8 over pi xy squared. Okay. Why did I do that? Is because you can recognize this xy squared uh, shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and do the dx by dl. Okay, dx by dl is simply dk inverse by dl. So that is 4 pi cubed y squared. And now you can see that if I do d by d l of x squared, I will have 2x dx by dl. So I will have 8 pi cubed x y squared. So now we can recognize that these two quantities up to some factor of pi to the fourth are really the same thing. So from here, we conclude that d by dl of x squared minus pi to the fourth y squared, essentially, once I do that, I will get 0. So as I go along these trajectories, x and y are changing. But the combination x squared minus pi to the fourth y squared is not changing. So all of the trajectories that I have drawn, at least sufficiently close to this point around which I am expanding, correspond to lines that are x squared minus pi to the fourth y squared is some constant that I'll call c. And that constant must be whatever you started with. So if I call the trajectory here to be the combination x0, y0, the original values, I can figure out what my x0 to the fourth minus pi to the fourth y0 to the fourth is. And that's going to be staying constant along the entire trajectory. So these trajectories are, in fact, portions of a hyperbole. So this is the equation that you would have for a hy hyperbola in x, y plane. Now clearly, there are two types of hyperbole, the ones that go like this and the ones that go like that. In fact, this one and this one are pretty much the same thing. And what distinguishes this pattern versus that pattern is whether this constant c is positive or negative. Because you can see that out here, ultimately, you end up at a point where y has gone to 0. So depending on x positive or negative, it doesn't matter. This combination will be positive. So throughout here, what I have is that c is positive. Whereas what I have up here is c that is negative. Presumably there is some other 
trajectory here and down here C is again positive. Okay? Again, if you want to ensure why over here C is negative, because over here you can see you cross the line where Y is zero, sorry, X is zero, but you have some value of Y. Okay? So if I were to blow up that region, look as a function of X and Y, well, first of all, I will have a particular set of trajectories, the ones that end up at this uh, important fixed point, which correspond clearly to c equals to 0. So the c equals to 0 will give me two straight lines. So presumably, there is this straight line, and then there is another straight line goes out there. And then I have this bunch of trajectories that are these hyperbole that end up over here. I will have hyperboles that will be going out. And then I will have hyperboles that are like this. These are all in the high temperature phase, so let's make them like this. Okay. So one thing that you immediately see is that the location of the transition that is given by this critical line is when c equals to 0. So statement number one that we can get is that the transition line corresponds to c equals to 0. So solving for uh, x as a function of y, I will get that x critical is either minus or plus pi squared y. Clearly from the figure, the solution that I want is the one that corresponds to minus. My x was k inverse minus pi over 2. So this is kc inverse minus pi over 2. And so what I see is that Kc inverse, the correct transition temperature, is in fact lower than the value of pi over 2 that we had deduced, assuming that there is only a single vortex in the entire system, by an amount that to lowest order is related to the uh, core energy or core frugacity and presumably there are higher order terms that I haven't calculated. So this number that we had calculated by looking at a single defect, you can see that in the presence of multiple defects, starts to get lower. And this is precisely correct in the limit where y is a small quantity. Okay. Now, that's the transition line. We can look to the left or to the right. Let us look at the low temperature phase. OK. So for the low T phase, we expect C to be negative. And uh, I can, for example, make that explicit by writing it as, uh, OK, so C was uh, x0 squared minus pi to the fourth y0 squared, what the starting parameters of the system dictate. If you are on the low temperature phase such that C is negative, it means that you are at temperatures that are smaller than Tc. So let's see, T minus Tc, uh, let's write it as Tc minus T would be positive. But this has to be negative, so let me just introduce some parameter B. It's not the same B as here, just some 
coefficient that has to be squared. And so I know that as I hit Tc, this C goes to 0. If I'm slightly away from Tc along the uh, trajectory that I have indicated over here, right here I'm 0, so right here I'm slightly negative, and there is no reason why the value that I calculated from x0 squared minus pi to the fourth y0 squared should not be an analytical function. So I have expanded that analytical function knowing that that Tc is equal to zero. There will be higher order terms for sure, but this is the lowest order term that I would have in an expansion. Okay? And as we said, this is preserved all along the trajectory that ends at this point. So along that trajectory, this is the same as x squared minus pi to the fourth y squared. Okay? Which means that I can write x uh, y squared to be 1 over pi to the fourth x squared plus b squared t minus c minus t. Okay? So if I want to solve for this curve, that's what I will have for some value of this quantity. And what I do is I look at what that implies for the x, y, dl. The x, y, dl is 4 pi cubed y squared. I substitute the y squared that I have over there. I will get 4 over pi times x squared plus b squared tc minus t. Okay. So under rescaling, this tells me what is happening to x. And in particular, what I can do is to integrate this equation. I have dx divided by x squared plus b squared tc minus t is 4 over pi dl just rearranging this differential equation. And this I can certainly integrate out to L. This you should recognize as the uh, differential form of the inverse tangent. Up to a factor of 1 over b square root of pc minus t. So I integrate this, and on the other side I have 4 over pi L. Okay. So eventually, I know that uh, this is what I wanted to do. I needed to do this later on, but we use it later on. Uh, what I needed to get is what is the eventual fate of this differential equation. The eventually, we see that this differential equation arrives at a point that I will call x infinity. When it arrives at x infinity, this is 0 and y is 0. So I immediately know that x infinity, I didn't need to do any of that calculation, uh, this expression has to be 0, is minus d square root of uh, tc minus t. So let me figure out what I did with the signs that is incorrect. In the low temperature phase, I have indeed stated that C has to be positive, right? Which means that this coefficient better be positive, which means that I would have a minus sign here. And then x would be uh, B times uh, T minus Tc, uh, Tc minus T. Right, so this would be plus or minus. The plus solution is somewhere out here, which I'm not interested. The solution that I'm interested in corresponds to this value. 
Okay. You say, well, what, what is important about that? You see that various properties of this low temperature phase are characterized by this power law as opposed to exponential behavior. The power law is determined by the value of k where the description in terms of this gradient square theory is correct. Now, out here, the description is not correct because I still have the topological defects. But if I look at sufficiently large distances, I see that the topological defects have disappeared. But by the time the topological defects have disappeared, I don't have the original value of k. I have a slightly different value of k. So, presumably, the properties are going to be described by what the value of this k inverse is at large behaviors. And so, what I expect is that the effective behavior of this k inverse uh, actually the effective behavior of k <coughs> as a function of whatever the temperature of the system is. We expect that in the original XY model or any system that is described by this behavior, there is a critical temperature, Pc, such that at higher temperatures, correlations are de uh, decaying exponentially, so essentially the effective value of k has gone to zero. There is no stiffness parameter. So basically, at high temperatures, you should be over here. What I see is that the effective value of k, however, is meaningful all the way to the inverse of 2 over pi. So there is a value here at 2 over pi, which corresponds to the largest k that is uh, uh, the largest temperature or the smallest k that is uh, acceptable. Now what I see is that on approaching the transition, the value of k, I have it up there, is 2 over pi, this uh, limiting value that we have over here. And then there is a correction that is uh, 4 over pi squared x. And presumably here I have to put the x infinity. And what I have for the x infinity is something like that. So I will get 2 over pi plus 4 b over pi squared square root of tc minus t. So the prediction is that the true value of uh, the effective value of k comes to its limiting value of 2 over pi with the square root singularity. So we can replace the theory that describes anything that is in this universality class in the low temperature phase by an effective value of k. If we then ask how does that effective value of k change as a function of temperature, the prediction is that, well, at very low temperature, it presumably is inversely related to temperature. It will come down. But it then it will change its behavior, come with a square root singularity to a number that is 2 over pi, and then jump to 0. Now you are justified in saying, well, this is all very obscure. Is there any way to see this? <coughs> 
And the answer is that people have experimentally verified this, and I'll tell you how. So a system that belongs to this universality class, and we've measured all the way, uh, we've uh, mentioned all the way in the class, is the superfluid. We've said that the superfluid transition is characterized by a quantum uh, order parameter that acquires a magnitude, but then it has a phase theta. And roughly, you would say that the phase theta should be described by this kind of theory at low temperatures. So if you want basically a two-dimensional system, what we need to do is to look at the superfluid fit. And this is something that uh, Bishop and Repi did in 1978, where they constructed the analog of the Andronikashvili experiment that we mentioned in 8333, applied it to the film. So let me remind you what the Andronikash Vili uh, experiment was. Basically, we will have a uh, torsional oscillator. This torsional oscillator was <coughs> connected to a bat that had helium in it. So basically, this thing was oscillating, and the frequency of oscillations was related to some kind of a effective uh, torsion of constant k divided by some huge mass which is uh, contained within the cylinder. So basically, you can probe classically you would say there's some kind of a density here. You can calculate what the mass is. If you know what this is, you know what the uh, omega is. Now, what he noticed was that if this thing was filled with liquid helium and you went below Tc of uh, helium, then suddenly this frequency changed. And the reason was that the mass that was rotating along with this whole thing was changed because the part that was superfluid was sitting still. And the normal part was the part that was oscillating. So the mass that was oscillating was reduced. Frequency would go up. And from the change in frequency, he could figure out the change in the density of the part that was oscillating and hence calculate what the density of the normal part was. So what Bishop and Refki did was to make this two-dimensional. How did they make it two-dimensional? Rather than having a container of heli a helium, what they did was they made, if you like, some kind of a toilet paper. They call it a jelly roll of mylar. So there was mylar that was wrapped into a cylinder. And then the helium was absorbed between the surfaces of mylar. So effectively, it was a two-dimensional system in this very setup. Okay. So for that two-dimensional system, they again did the same thing. They measured the change in frequency. They found that if they go to low enough temperature, suddenly there is a change in frequency. Of course, the temperature that they were seeing in this case was something like one degree Kelvin or fraction of one degree Kelvin, whereas when you have the full superfluid, it is 2.8 degrees Kelvin. Clearly, because of the dimensionality, the critical temperature changes, but you would say that's not particularly universal. So they could measure the change in frequency and relate the change in frequency to, a uh, to the density that became superfluid. Okay. Now, how does the superfluid density tell us anything about this curve? Well, the answer is that everything 
is going to be weighted by something like e to the minus beta times some energy. The energy, one part of the energy that is associated with oscillations is certainly the kinetic energy. So let's see what we would write down for beta times the kinetic energy of uh, superfluid or superfluid film. Uh, what I have to do is beta will give me 1 over kT. The kinetic energy is obtained by integrating mass times velocity squared or density integrated again velocity okay it's a two-dimensional film so we sort of integrate as we go along the film the superfluid velocity can be related to uh, the mass of helium h bar and the gradient of this phase of the superconducting oil parameter so you can, for example, write your wave function as psi bar e to the i theta of x, calculate what the current is using the usual formula of h bar over m psi star grad psi minus psi grad psi star, and you will see that the effective mass is something like this. So this is going to give me a rho over kT h bar over m helium 4 squared integral gradient of theta squared, which you can see is identical to the very first line that I wrote down <coughs> for you. And we can see that k can be interpreted as rho kt h bar over m So all of these quantities, h bar m you know, t is the temperature that you're measuring, rho you get through the change in this frequency. Okay? And so then they can plot what this rho is as a function of temperature. You can see that it is very much related to k. And indeed, they find that uh, uh, the row that they measure has some kind of a behavior such as this. And then they go and change their mylar, make the film thicker or whatever. They find that the transition temperature changes so that a different type of film would show behavior such as this. It will thicker films will have a higher uh, critical temperature. They did it for a number of film thicknesses. And they got things, behavior such as this. And found that this behavior followed a straight line, which is exactly what is predicted from here. It's predicted that rho c over tc should be kb m over h bar squared times what the critical value of k is that we've calculated to be uh, 2 over pi. Okay? So they could precisely check this 2 over pi that we've calculated. They could more or less see the square root approach to the singularity. I'm not sure the data at that point were good enough so that they could say this exponent was precisely <coughs> one half. But, uh, right. Right. So this was for the low temperature phase. What can I say about the high temperature phase? So in the high temperature phase is where my C is uh, negative, okay? So there I can write 
x0 squared minus uh, uh, pi to the fourth y0 squared as being a negative number which I will write as minus b squared t minus tc so I'm not t that is greater than tc multiply with some constant and I get this and uh, this is the same all along the trajectory so as I go further and x and y change they will change in a manner that is consistent with this which implies that as x changes with L and y changes with L, the two of them will be related by y squared is be being x squared plus b squared uh, t, t minus tc divided by pi to the fourth. Okay, so this is where I don't really see the endpoint of the trajectory. I just want to see how the trajectory is behaving. So I go back to this equation. The x by the l is uh, 4 pi cubed y squared. Substitute that y squared. I will get 4 over pi, 1 over x squared plus b squared t minus tc. And then I rearrange this in a form that I can see how to integrate the x, x squared plus b squared t minus tc is 4 over pi dl. I integrate the left hand side and as I already jumped ahead it is the inverse tangent of x divided by b square root of t minus tc is 4 over pi times l okay so what do i want to do with this expression so what I want to do is to see the trajectories that just cross to the high temperature side. So I start with a point that is just slightly to the right of this transition line. Presumably what is happening is that I will follow the transition trajectory for a long while, then I will start to head out okay which means that for this trajectory if I look at the system over larger and larger scales initially I find that it becomes harder and harder to create these topological defects the core energy for them becomes large the fugacity for them becomes small but ultimately I manage to break that and I go to a regime where it becomes easier and easier to create these topological defects and presumably at some point out here everything that I have said I have to throw out because I'm making an expansion assuming that y is small x is small etc so presumably as I integrate I come to a point where I say, okay, differential equations break down, but my intuition tells me that I have reached the regime where I can create pretty much plus or minus uh, uh, charges at ease. So I would say that once I have reached that region where X and Y have managed to escape the region where they are small, they have become off the order of one, maybe you can put them one third, one fourth, it doesn't matter. Once they have become something that is not infinitesimal, then I can create these charges more or less at will. I will have a system where I have lots of charges that can be created at ease, 
And my intuition tells me that in that system, I should have this kind of decay, exponential decay. Okay? So how far did I have to go in order to reach that value of L? I have to go to a correlation length or a size that is larger than one what I started with by a factor of e to the L, where the value of x became something that is of the order of 1. And actually, you can see from here that if I'm very close to the transition, it doesn't matter whether I choose here to be 1 tenth, 1 half, even 1 over 100. As long as I'm close enough to Tc, I'm dividing something by something that is close to 0. And this is tan inverse of a large number. And tan inverse of a large number is tan inverse of 90 degrees. So essentially, I go to some value of x where I can approximate this by pi over 2. Okay? And you can see that that is very insensitive to what I choose to be my x's as long as I'm sufficiently close to the critical point. So you can see that once I have done that, I have figured out what my L star is, if you like. And if I substitute that over there, I will get a behavior that is uh, uh, about pi over 4 times mm -hmm. pi over 2 times 1 over b squared root of t minus t. Now these coefficients out front are not that important. What you see is that indeed we get a correlation length that as we approach tc diverges but it is not at all of any of the forms that we had seen before. So typically, we wrote that the correlation lens diverges t minus tc to some exponent minus nu. This is not that type of divergence. It's a very different type of divergence. And again, its root is in the nonlinear version of the recursion relations that we have. The closest thing to this that we have is when we were calculating the correlation length for the nonlinear sigma model, where we had something that had a 1 over temperature type of behavior in it. This is even more complicated. Now, once you know the singular behavior of the correlation length, you would say that in a two-dimensional system, the singular part of the free energy should scale like c to the minus 2. Essentially, your, you break your system into pieces that are of the size correlation length. The number of those pieces is L over Xi squared, because you are in two dimensions. So you would get this. So that says that your singularity of the free energy is something like, I don't know, pi squared 8, 4b square root of t minus tc. Again, not a power law singularity. It's an essential singularity. An essential singularity is a kind of singular function that no matter how many derivatives you, you take at t equals to tc, there is no singularity. So for example, if I take two derivatives to get the heat capacity, what I would plot as a function of t at tc should have no signature. So basically what you would see because of this is that the curve just continues. There is no signature of a transition at the heat capacity. And indeed, people later on, they did numerical simulations, etc. What they find is that the heat capacity actually has kind of smooth peak a little bit later than Tc, which is the location where there's lots and lots of uh, vortex unbinding going on. But at Tc itself, there is no signature of a singularity. Okay. Uh, as far as I know there is no experimental 
uh, case where this correlation length has been observed. Okay. So, the lesson that we can take from this particular system is that two-dimensional systems are kind of potentially interesting and different. We had this uh, uh, Mermin-Wagner theorem that we mentioned at the beginning that said that there should be no true long-range order in two dimensions. That is still true. But despite that, there could be phase transitions with quite observable uh, uh, consequences. And a particular type of uh, transition in two dimension that we will pursue next lecture, so I'll give you a preview, is that of uh, melting. So the prototype of a phase transition you may think of is either liquid gas or a liquid solid. And you can say, well, you have studied phase transitions to such a degree. Why not go back and talk about the uh, melting transition, for example? Uh, the reason is that the straight melting transition is typically first order. And we've seen that universality and all of those things emerge when you have a diverging correlation length. So, and you want to have a place where there is a pos potential for a continuous phase transition. And it turns out that melting in two dimensions provides that. So in two dimensions, you could have a bunch of points that could, for example, in a minimum energy configuration at t equals to 0, form a triangular lattice. Okay. Now, when you go to finite temperature, as we discussed again at the very first lecture, you will start to have distortions around this. You can describe these distortions through a vector u of x and y. And then go to the appropriate continuum limit that describes the elasticity of these, these things. And it is going to look very much like that gradient of theta squared term that we wrote at the beginning, except that since this u is a vector, as we saw, even for an isotropic material, you will have the potential for having multiple elastic constants. But modular that, the conclusion that you would have is that as long as it is OK for me to make an expansion that is like the elastic theory, some kind of a gradient of U expansion, the conclusion would be that the correlations in U would grow logarithmically as a function of size. And you will not have a, a true long range order, but you will have some kind of a power law behavior, such as the one that we have indicated over there. On the other hand, when you go to very high temperature, presumably this whole thing melts. There is no reason to have correlations beyond the few uh, atoms that are close to you. And so typically, at high temperature, correlations would decay exponential. So this low temperature expansion, this elastic theory expansion that we have written down, has to break down also in this case. And a particular mechanism for its breakdown in two dimension is to create these topological defects which in the case of solid will correspond to this location line that, for example, correspond to adding an additional row of particles here, terminating at some point. And we can go through exactly the same kind of story as we had before and conclude that these dislocations, because of the competition between their energy cost growing logarithmically and their entropy gain growing logarithmically, we need to unbind at the critical temperature. And so that provides a mechanism 
for describing the melting of two dimensional materials in a language that is very similar to this, except for the complications that are have to do with this being a vector rather than a scalar quantity. And so what we find is that these topological charges are different from minus two, uh, plus two pi. The interactions between them is a vector version of the Coulomb interaction, but that many of the RG and re other results go through and we will get an idea of what happens when the solid melts because of the unbinding of these dislocations, but there is a puzzle that we will find that it will not melt into a liquid, but into something that is more like a liquid crystal. So we will along the way discover also something about liquid crystals.